You might have seen this picture of that bridge already in press. Maybe it's already some months back. Um, you might know the Swiss Alps, they have very famous mountains. One of the most famous ones is the Mount Toblerone or Matterhorn. And just in front of, of that mountain, there is now the longest pedestrian suspension bridge in the world, which ranges about a bit more than 1,600 feet. Um, so it's quite a, quite a challenge for everybody to pass that bridge. So you watch down, you see 300 feet below, there is nothing. It goes side by side. Um, very interesting challenge. So if you have some time left after the summit, I can encourage you to go there for a hike. It's a beautiful area and take up that challenge. Also at Swisscom, we took a challenge. We tried to bridge things. We tried to bring people together. We tried to bring cultures together. And we tried to make the, our environment a better place. And in the next minutes, we want to, to present you a little bit something out of our journey that we had, um, trying to bridge our beautiful cloud native world with the classic enterprise environment. I'm going to start with a small story. So there is Hans. Hans is a developer at Swisscom. Hans knows the cloud native ecosystem very, very well. So for already for a couple of years, he has, did, he has done some projects pushed his code, consumed services, and he's a happy customer. Mainly because everything is API driven. Now, that's not new for most of you. Huh? It's standardized interface, and everything is self-service. So for him, he gets immediate feedback if he does something. If he issues something, it takes minutes to be ready. and. The best thing in a, in a large enterprise, you get built-in compliance. So you, it's very hard to do things wrong and break the rules. Now Hans got tasked to do a bit bigger project where he cannot solve every, each of his problems within this cloud native ecosystem. So for that, he might need a very special database. Um, let's call that database Oracle for now. Um, which is by design not that easy to, to run in that cloud native space. So there is a classic enterprise environment where such services are built since decades and they're engineered very well with very, in, very skilled people who, who operate them. Um, Hans also has an experience with these people from earlier. So there's also a standard interface, it's called Mail with the standard protocol, SMTP. And it's, all, it's very fancy. On the other end, you get their people, and they do natural language processing and try to figure out what you really want. The experience that Hans gets is, hey, you get feedback based on the human motivation on the other side. Things usually take days, weeks, maybe even months. and you experience the full bandwidth of these heavyweight manual processes. Now, Hans came to us and said, hey, I really like the cloud native stuff. Why can't we just do the same with, with our classic ecosystem? And of course, we, we were thinking about that. And while we were having discussions, we came to, to a very important conclusion. Huh? We have two silos here. Nobody likes the word silos, but essentially there are two silos. And there is one thing missing. So at some point when you do a project, you, they need to interact somehow. And based on our experience, um, this thing in between is a black hole. Like today we had this teaser with the Cloud Foundry or Cloud Native Galaxy with all these planets and spaceships. And as you know, in the universe, there are also black holes. And sometimes connectivity is kind of a black hole, when you're, especially when you come from a development point of view. Based on experiments, though, we found out, or we could prove that there are at least, can you press one? Thanks. 
there are at least n plus two firewalls involved. So n is the amount of things that the people around us know about, and there are for sure two additional ones that no one knows about. And with that, we, involve, we continued these discussions and asked, hey, how can we improve this, this situation? How can we make the user experience better when it comes to these kind of services that our users want to consume? Um, and there were people having very great ideas. They said, can you switch? It stopped working. They said, use APIs. That's, that will solve all, all of your issues, and you can do everything by machines, and you don't have to care anymore. Now, um, this is true. So it's a best practice, decoupling teams, using APIs, how that works well. We see that at very large scale with, with Amazon, Google, and, and all these folks. That's kind of proven. But there is always a but. And the bot started when small story with, that we had with our connectivity engineers. So they are brilliant people, and they really know, they really understand understand this black hole where we kind of stop and say, "Oh, we cannot see how that works." So we are a bit afraid. Maybe they really understand it, and they built the APIs for their connectivity stuff. Really automate all these bloody infrastructures and so on. And we got a lot, of, a lot of documentation how we can use their APIs, which should make our lives easier. Everything started with um, a book full of sequence diagrams. But they were complex, back and forth communication, and so on. Then we had an appendix um, full of network topologies that we had to understand. And in the detailed specification, of the API, there were tons of parameters that we really didn't understood. And our conclusion after that one was, hey, so now we need to learn, we still need to learn how network topologies really work, and we need to learn and understand how PGP is working in order to use their API. And with that question, we had an interesting discussion, Matthias and I, and we were really thinking, hey, is there a way that we, how we can simplify that process, how we can force people to think, start to think in simple patterns? And I think Matthias has a great answer for that. Yeah, so at least we, we tried with one approach, and that, that was um, not, basically not our idea. So we, we spent the last three years, Bowen and I, to build up this cloud-native ecosystem. And as you might know, there is actually already a well-established contract between applications and services, which is, which is called OSB API. For people not knowing what this is about, this is basically a very, very simple API that allows you to uh, provision um, services to your users and also bind these services then to your app so that they can use the services. So uh, this OSB API was um, well proven in, the, in, in, in our cloud native ecosystems. We have built probably one or two years to bring up these services which were working fine. So we, we basically thought, can we just break down these, these more complex services also in, in, this API, um, in this API? So what we then um, tried is we, we went and we went to the classic enterprise ecosystems. We went to each C, uh, service teams, which might be databases, the Oracle ones, or a Sybase one, but also all the services, for example, the connectivity one or an internet um, team, and also stuff like email service or messaging services. And uh, we, we tried to make them trying to implement the OSP API. And the idea would be that each team owns this OSP API, so to say, as a contract to the outside world, and so to, to allow basic interactions to the cloud world. We tried this approach. And um, we even went a step ahead, because uh, within Swisscoms, um, there are a lot of different services. So there's legacy services, and there's new services. Um, we have a, a huge zoo of services. So we, try, we, we tried and went um, ahead with this, with this guideline, which says we should produce each service where it makes most sense, for example, which means the NetApp stays it's in, in its place. We don't virtualize it or try to, to migrate it to Kubernetes, but it's, it's there where it is. But um, we should abstract it away using the OSB API so that we can consume it everywhere. So um, there are a lot of these service producers, as we call them, which range from the, the cloud-native stuff to the more um, um, classic stuff. 
And um, Kubernetes could also be produced as a service if you want to consume that, just as a fun fact. And within Swisscoms, we have a lot of different consumers. So we don't only have um, platform as a service, and that's recently announced also the container as a service and consumers, but we also have a, an infrastructure as a service, and the people there would also profit from having access to these services. So, and also we have some customers that um, would like to also access these services from their own prem since they're just migrating to the cloud or having some hybrid story. And in, in between, to allow this, we came up with, thank you, Swisscom, we came up with this OSB API is basic um, contract between all, all service producers and all the clouds on the top level would have to implement these clients. And um, of course, this is a little bit, um, OSB API is very basic, so we had to implement some extensions when it comes to events, metering, and logging. We will get to that later. And of course, we also had to automate the black hole, and so there was some connectivity automation involved. And the plot twist about this is that the connectivity automation itself is also an OSB API. So, so we have tried that now, probably for the last year, we tried all the various sorts and forms of services to put into this OSB API, and we have learned quite, a, quite some stuff about it. So let's share our experiences. When it comes to strengths, um, yeah, it's a standard. So what do I mean with standard, and what do you get out of it? So when I say OSB API is a standard, it means basically all the consumers, when they have implemented it once, they can use all services, which is a nice thing. Huh? So you save a lot of effort. And for Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, you get the client implementations right away since they're supported out of the box. And um, it also means, it also goes the other way around. So if you have your clients once working, then you can basically also use the hybrid cloud provider um, service brokers. For example, Pivotal has recently um, released their AWS service brokers, and also Google has the, the service brokers. So if we so slowly sh um, moving to the, uh, to the hyper cloud, then we might just plug them the services in, try to work this as well. And also, you could use that across companies. Huh? So if, you're, if your partner company has a nice service, you could just hook it up to your cloud portfolio. Um, it has a very simple pattern, so what does it mean? It actually forces you to design your services very simple, so it means you only have these two operations, so you better make your service, your service interaction work with these two, um, these two actions, and this also means, um, it also means some limits, huh? so we will come to that afterwards. But um, the th what something that was nice was, um, it was very easy to understand, right? it forced you you could not have the sequence diagram with bidirectional communication. It forced you to, to really um, be simple, and um, it was very easy to understand. So we could um, sit together with the connectivity engineers or with the database engineers, and they would get the service broker API specification like in 30 minutes when we explained them. And it was also easily, uh, very easily to implement. So we had this one, um, after this one whiteboard session, they, we, they could just go off and implement it basically because they have also good libraries. So it's, it's, it was very easy to, <clears throat> to really implement it then in the end. And the last thing, um, which might sound like a limit, so Open Service Broker API currently is based on polling. So, so if you want to know about the state of your service, then you have to actually poll, which might sound like a limit, but it actually also um, really constrains you to use basic REST and not being able to talk the other way around, which then ends up in communication nightmares. So we actually had a lot of services that really worked well, um, benefiting from these these strengths, but there were also a lot of limits, so we had to figure out that we cannot just press every service into this API. Yes, so I have the honor to talk about things that didn't work so well huh, during our journey. I'm going to start with a couple of technical things that we experienced, trying to, to really build more advanced services. Um, first thing is relations. Once you, you pass the level of my service is I want to consume API A or I want to create the DB schema somewhere. Once it gets bigger and more complex, you hit limits quite early, quite, quite early in your process. Um, and we checked out in the community and we follow proposals from others. For example, in that area, we kind of followed how the, the Azure folks solved that issue with parent references, um, but it doesn't feel like very native. 
Then another issue which also had to do a lot with, with more complex services or maybe not cloud native or cloud ready services is the binding concept. So binding as we know is A built for apps and B is ephemeral. And the ephemeral part is quite hard for, for some services because they usually assign credentials or users with ownership within, within your service. Um, and once you want to unbind or, in other words, get rid of that user, um, it's quite hard because that user owns some objects and you don't really know what to do with these objects. Then another thing, we already heard that this morning in the keynote from SAP, by default the catalog is static, so that you cannot really dynamically change things without notifying the consumer platforms. Um, I think it's a very interesting talk this afternoon as a follow-up fr from SAP when they show more about their service manager. I can really recommend to join that session. I'm too far away, probably. <laughs> no, it's actually Swisscom trying to lock me in into the Wi-Fi. Good. So next point that's, that's not on the list is, uh, oh, no, here is, is uh, day two actions or advanced tasks. So a very good example is backup restore that's not part of the OSB specification. So there is provisioning and binding and that's it. Whatever you want to do after you have created your service or one week later, two weeks later, that's out of concept, um, which again has some limitations. Then on the cultural side, we also experienced some limits. So we found that not everyone, especially when it comes to these Highly engineered teams, they know a technology very well, but usually they're not the software engineers. And they cannot become software engineers within, within a month or two. So it takes some time to understand the complexity, how to build software which serves all the needs that, that, that we, we expect as a consumer of an open service broker API. Then, Another thing that I like to name the GUID problem. I think a lot of you remember these times where we had naming conventions for everything, and naming conventions were usually made in a way that you can read out the customer and the stage, if it's production or not. You could read, like say, the whole history of, of an application or a system just based on the name. And with introducing OSB API as kind of the broker to, to create new instances, you have to deal with GUIDs, which from an operator point of view doesn't feel that, that nice. So you kind of have to get rid of your pet thinking model where you every day say hi to all of your pets and look how they are. You just trust in the system. And the last point, and we had an interesting discussion about the deprovisioning use case if that is really a valid use case. So should we really allow our customers to buy themselves with just one call without a safety net, a multi-step process to be able to delete their data? These were kind of the, the discussions that we had. And I don't want to answer if this is right or wrong, but just to give you an overview of also on a cultural level what things we hit. Okay, so after we've learned about all these limits and we still wanted to, to continue the journey with OSB API and all these services since it worked out pretty well for, 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 for most of the cases, so we thought about how can we mitigate this, this, these limits and um, we came up with a model that helped us uh, pretty good, which is basically the um, first step is to try can you do it within the OSB API, even if it means you probably have to cut off some corners maybe 
don't do this requirement. If it doesn't fit in, do we really need this requirement? Try to really use the standard, because it means if it's in the standard, you don't have to do any more efforts on your other platforms. So it, it's best if you can do it uh, within this API. And for example, one of the limits we had was this relation thingy. And when we reached out to the community, to the Azure guys, they were like, yeah, with this parent reference, you could do it just fine within, within the OSB API. You can model relations that way. And you can actually even use it very nicely from the CFCLI. So that was something. Let's, let's try to put it into, in, in the standard, because this is, this is where 90% or 80% of your services should go, and it means less effort in maintaining them. And if you cannot do this, if you cannot cover it with the basic thing, you can take a look at the extensions that are out there in the community, for example. Um, for backup restore, there are proposals out there, and that's what we did when we really needed backup restore. So um, there are these extensions out there, and we hope they get merged at some point so that every all the, the Cloud Foundries and Kubernetes clients, they, they support this kind of stuff so that we can do more advanced stuff. But yeah, try to keep it simple. Don't, don't try to, to rely on too much extension because that's going to hurt you with maintaining. And last but not least, if you really, really need to do something that's not possible within the OSB API, and especially that goes for the binding problem. So if you have to model Oracle databases with schema owners, you're going to delete all your data if these are bindings. So you have to use something different. So what, what OSB API? offers you there is actually you can delegate the whole management of your service instance to a third party endpoint, which can be a dashboard, which can be an API. So you basically can say, when I order, I can still order my Oracle database, and I can still maybe bind it to, for an API user, but then all the further management goes over this API, which also has a nice side effect that the teams themselves can maintain this API completely autonomous. So, but this means the most effort and the least um, profit from standardization, so we try to keep these numbers of services very low. Yeah, so that's basically how we cope with these limits. Um, and maybe some, um, some different interesting stuff that you're going to notice if you're going to build a lot of OSBs is that um, if you have all these different teams and they choose the technology they want, it's going to be a lot of different OSB technologies and. For example, the, the database team, they're used to WebLogic since, they're, since 10 years, and they want to use Java, so they write a Java o OSB. And the, the, another team, they are scripting guys coming from, from, from sysadmin background. They want to have an, um, a Python OSB. And uh, the, service, uh, the, the messaging guys, they have all these fancy process engines that they use um, to, to configure their router, so they just, their OSB API is just a layer on top of this process engine. Or the mail, um, the mail guys, they have everything API'd with the Apache, so they have an OSB API on top of that. So we've all seen all, all different kind of OSB APIs, but uh, as marketplace guys, we somehow need to make sure that they, can, they don't have to reinvent the wheel, and they don't have to solve the same challenges again. And so they all have the same challenges when it comes, for example, to state. If you use OSB, needs state, you have to solve that. It needs probably async handling if it has uh, async processes. And the security officer knocks at your door and says, hey, this OSB, they're so important because it's basically at the heart of your business. So if you, if you don't have security there, you can basically sell your business or whatever. You can just close down your business. And so he, he comes to me with, um, with his requirements and tells me, hey, make sure these guys store their credentials safely. Make sure that um, they're placed somewhere where it's secure and that you have stuff like audit and login, since we need to know what happened if, you, um, if, if the critical operations go over this, this API. So we thought about this. What should we do about this and still keep the autonomy of the teams? So what we came up with was basically this idea. We shouldn't try to force everyone to use Java, because that would just prevent the DB team from doing anything anymore. Um, we should instead provide guidelines and try to underline these guidelines with some tools and platforms that are really nice to use and get the job done. So, that's, so that the teams prefer to use our technologies and platforms than to build it themselves. So for example, to show you some guidelines we've come up with is we have some guidelines regarding placement and connectivity. We have created a VPN where everybody can hook his service broker in so that they can communicate with the client platforms very easily. Or we have uh, created a guideline regarding audit logging and monitoring what's required for you, for you if you want to bring your own OSB. 
and um, also how to secure your credentials safely. You might know, for example, CredUp or Vault offers this kind of stuff. And then we also have these tools and platforms that should make this easy. So we have this Swisscom open service broker that's, that's publicly available on GitHub, and it's an open source project, and this thing, for example, adds you CredUp support to solve this. It adds you, it adds um, white box monitoring for the, uh, the middle pillar, and it also, um, Runs fine as an app, as an app on, on Cloud Foundry, which is the second point. So we try to push very hard to, to push the, these OSBs internally on the Cloud Foundry because this offers you managed services where you can put your state. It offers you managed services, for example, for logging or for monitoring, so they can really cover the stuff on top. So that's how we try to get some governance over, over, over all the OSBs that we have. So. After having spent probably two years with OSBs and OSB APIs, would we do it again? So probably, um, what, what have we learned? So um, these limits really hurt you in some use cases. So we had um, discussions with really some, some, some service producers who tell me, why do you try to fit my service in this, in this very basic APIs? And we had trouble um, finding the, the, the right balance between standardization. So these limits really hurt you. Um, so it's good to know them. Um, one thing um, that was funny was that um, actually we had some success with the first OSBs and it worked out within the Cloud Foundry and then um, some guys came up with, hey, can't we solve this problem also with OSB API? And it was completely unrelated. So um, don't try to force too much in the API just because you can model it somehow to fit in the OSB API. It's especially important to, to know the limits here. Right? It's not a silver bullet, it does not solve the job, it's just one specific form of an API that allows you within the cloud space to provision services. Don't try to, too much to use it out, uh, um, outside. So our recommendation is also Know your use case, know what you want to do. Will it be limited to, the, to, to really service provisioning? Can it be done with these two operations? And especially uh, know, know, know the strengths and limits that we just highlighted before. So with that being said, we're open for questions. You can ask us, find us at the Swisscom booth or... Anytime. Anytime. Thanks a lot for your time. And have a good meal. <laughs> <laughs>